Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Don Means. It is June 19, 2020. Uh, and we are here for part 13 of the uh, What is a Library if the Building is Closed series uh, with uh, two uh, great speakers. We're going to talk about kind of a range here of, of different elements. Uh, specifically around the use of uh, wireless technologies to extend access to the internet and library digital services and also uh, hear more about what's happening in other parts of uh, the world outside of the US. Ramuna, are you with us, Ramuna? Not yet. Hmm. Stephen, would you send her a note just in case? Uh, so, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, the, uh, these sessions are hosted by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes out of uh, Brussels in the Netherlands. IFLA is a longtime partner of GLN in advocating and working for uh, universal access to universal public access. So it's our feeling that everyone should be within like walking distance of a, of a no fee or very low fee access point to be able to, to uh, join the, the, the digital conversation and access uh, all of the online resources that uh, society has become so dependent upon. Uh, our media co-host is Broadband Breakfast, uh, who has helped uh, spread the word on these and, and has written up uh, a number of our sessions that have been a good partner. Uh, before we move on, Stephen, uh, would you like to update us on what IFLA is doing or, or reporting uh, uh, as far as the, uh, the pandemic is, is concerned? Stephen? Yeah, Stephen, can you hear us? Stephen? Thank you, Don. Yes. Um, so, IFLA in its role as the we're working um, very much at the international level in order to try and really become a place where you can go to find out what's going on in other countries. And so we have been maintaining our own COVID-19 page, which is available from our homepage. And this in particular recently has become very full of examples of all of the plans and all of the reflections that libraries have been carrying out in looking to open safely. So you'll find now, I think we have examples from around 34 countries up there. I encourage you to take a look, as especially given that libraries around the world are facing very similar challenges in many ways. There's a lot that we can actually learn from looking at what each other are doing. I think one of the next subjects we're going to be looking at is very much how can we manage the same level of engagement between libraries and their communities. And this is clearly a theme that came up in last week's discussion. If it isn't possible to use the space in the same way as quite as freely as libraries would be able to do normally, how can libraries still be at this heart, the heart of this sense of community, the sense of togetherness? So this is hopefully something that we're going to be able to look into in the coming weeks and maybe share in a future round of one of these webinars. So thank you, Don. Excellent, Stephen. Uh, yes, uh, I'm glad you reminded us on uh, last week. Uh, we had uh, Eric Kleinenberg on, uh, the author of Palaces for the People, uh, kind of the seminal, current seminal book on uh, libraries and, and especially in terms of their role in, in social infrastructure. <clears throat> and so much of uh, what Eric has written about relates to uh, libraries as a place. And it seemed like over the last 10 years or so, the, the kind of top, one of the top level conversations about libraries are, are uh, spaces, multifunction spaces, creating more different kinds of specialized areas for certain kinds of activities, you know, meeting rooms, maker spaces, uh, programming, all kinds of things. And, so now suddenly the building is closed and Eric's challenge was, well, how can we, how can we think about library space outside in effect? How can, how can some of these activities occur outside? 
it's a it's an interesting question and a, and a huge challenge because it's certain times of the year, certain times of the day and weather, it's really hard to be outside. So uh, that will, that's another challenge for libraries to figure out. What they're left with, if the building is closed, principally is uh, their, their digital services, which have been expanding rapidly uh, uh, over the past, now I guess we're in our, kind of our fourth month of this uh, event, uh, and we've seen and the reports have been coming in that, that demand for uh, uh, digital services increased you know, 50%, 100%. It varies uh, from library to library. So um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a fascinating presentation. It is recorded as all of these sessions, this one including, uh, included on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide. So uh, if you miss it today, you can go back. If you caught it today, but you'd like to hear it again, it's there for you. Uh, so I just pulled this off of an article today, uh, speaking of month four, uh, that, you know, it's kind of frightening uh, graph showing the, the history over the last few months of uh, the number of cases where you can see the EU and the, and the US were in early April, just almost identical uh, places in, uh, in exposures, in number of cases. And then through the various kinds of uh, responses, uh, distancing, lockdowns, masks, the rest of it, uh, the European numbers have fallen precipitously, more or less in line with the rise, whereas the U.S. has has kind of plateaued, it looks like. And even you can infer that, that it's starting to go back up. Uh, and, and there's a lot of evidence that that may be the case. Uh, it's tracked by different states in the U.S., and we're seeing uh, some states going down continuing to fall in the number of cases and others rising. <clears throat> many, <coughs> pardon me, many rural areas that had not been exposed early on are finding the, the, the virus showing up and exposures are, are really rising rapidly. A lot of, a lot of places, uh, this, this is part of the story in, in the post today, uh, more or less around why the Europeans are kind of alarmed, the rest of the world is alarmed that the U.S. seems to be giving up on this. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a tragic comment on the U.S. leadership in the face of such a crisis. Uh, and, and it also creates another challenge for each of us and as institutions and how we respond. Uh, in response, we have, uh, Hopefully, two speakers. I, 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 we haven't heard from Ramona yet. Ramona, are you on? Appears not. Uh, Michael Calabres. Uh, uh, from Hi, Virginia. Don. I, I, ah, I'm okay. here. I just All was right. muted. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, uh, Michael Calabres with the New America Foundation, uh, Open Technology Institute, is uh, going to take us into uh, a, a range of discussions around uh, different kinds of uh, spectrum resources that are available to us. And, uh, and Ramona will uh, tell us about the work of IFL, the Electronic Information for Libraries uh, uh, group, consortium, I'm not sure about that, Ramona, uh, on the uh, activities that uh, they're involved in, some 50 countries supporting libraries around the world, uh, Africa, Asia, South America, and uh, we'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, here's the kind of running title of the, of the series. Uh, we've explored different aspects of this question in terms of internet access, things that that libraries have been doing, uh, providing internet access in the U.S. One in three adults accesses the internet at a library or did. Uh, digital services I just talked about is a key 
Today, it's more important than ever. Physical materials remain important uh, service of libraries. It's traditional, but it's now it's starting to happen again as a curbside uh, pickup and delivery of, uh, of materials is starting to happen. And then uh, this uh, element of uh, this more subjective element of social infrastructure and the role that libraries play in their communities. The, the binding concept here uh, we're putting forth is that assuring access to public information is an essential service. Uh, admittedly, it's below food and water, but it is, uh, a society can't really function without access. A, a modern society uh, can't function without access to what most of us take for granted. What we're just using today like it's ordinary. I mean, we're talking about kind of Zoom fatigue where a lot of people have never heard of Zoom. Assuring this access is what libraries do and they, and they do it best. Uh, nobody else has this kind of mission. Uh, our group, the Gigabit Libraries Network, an open collaboration of uh, library, uh, innovative libraries, uh, working with technology and, and a range of objectives. And uh, so today we're going to kick off uh, a new uh, thread, a new running part of a conversation uh, to develop these ideas as we go along. And uh, Michael is going to kick us off on that shortly. <laughs> and this is the concept here of, of taking advantage of uh, these assets, many of which are open and free, like Wi-Fi. Nobody, you don't have to pay anybody to use Wi-Fi. It's just public spectrum that we share and use. And it is by far the most uh, popular uh, wireless technology uh, around the world. Billions of devices uh, have Wi-Fi embedded in it. Uh, we will get into uh, these other, uh, well, it's kind of the alphabet soup of telecom acronyms, but these are all wireless standards that are relevant today, and we'll find out how shortly. Um, I just wanted to touch on this point about the urgency of the moment. Of course, we're in a crisis, and we're trying to figure this out, what it means long term to to operate and function and and lead lives uh, within the context of what the virus is permitting us. Uh, it's, it's stunning how quickly uh, civilization is, as a whole has reshaped itself in response to, to what the virus is permitting. And we've never seen a, a, a transformation so massive and so sudden. It's, it's stunning. And yet humans are extraordinarily adaptable. And we, we, you know, two days later, it's just kind of normal. Uh, but what is not normal and, and may be the biggest challenge, social challenge is, is school. How do we have school if, if their buildings are closed and, and school is happening online, either full time or intermittently or part time? And so this has been a, a challenge in the U.S. for a long time. How do we, how do we connect everyone, particularly uh, students who, who, uh, who, can't oh, participate, wow. who can't participate in school because they don't have connections? And if a number of students lack those connections, then effectively school isn't happening. And if school isn't happening, parents are at home. They're not, uh, you know, out where they where they might need to be to to make a living. So it just is kind of bringing uh, society to a near standstill, and it's cheating the the kids out of uh, the the very critical uh, environment, learning environment that they need to develop, and then we as a society uh, suffer from that. But we have the technology, and we certainly have the need. So uh, we, we need, we're, we're, we're really advocating that libraries take yet another step in, in how, they, uh, how they provide their services and how they, how they uh, step up to uh, community needs. Uh, this is an image I showed last week. This was a, a fire. This is a, an island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay, Angel Island. And, uh, fire was started. This is like 
over 10 years ago, uh, a camper. And so the island was ablaze. And that very day, this, uh, this sailing ship, this super yacht, which is like uh, 200 feet tall and over 200 feet long, uh, was just happened to be in the bay. It, this, this in, incredibly sophisticated piece of machinery and technology can be run by a single person. One person can sail this boat. They can actually do it from their, from their living room uh, by remote. Uh, but, and yet we're not really dealing with the urgencies of, uh, uh, we thought this a metaphor for the, you know, the, the, the planet kind of heating up and burning. Uh, and where I am today and where Michael is in California, we're, we're into fire season already here in, in June. It's usually not until the fall, was it until the fall, but it's here today. And our utility is warning us here in the county where I live uh, that outages uh, are to be expected as they reduce the load on the, on the grid to reduce the fire danger. So we're all trying to scrambling for our own backup uh, plans just in response to, uh, to a, an intentional cutoff. Well, enough background. Let's, uh, let's move to our speakers. And we're going to ask Ramona to, to go first here and talk about the work of Eiffel and what's happening uh, with the libraries that you've been supporting around the world. And uh, take it away, Ramona. Thanks for coming. Let me. Thank you very stop much. Screen share here. Yeah. Okay. You're on. Yes, just a minute. So, thanks, Don. Um, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, Don has asked me to contribute to the dialogue on global connectivity or ICT crisis, but I thought that maybe we shall call it access to knowledge crisis on global uh, scale, because with the closure of libraries in many countries, as well as schools, infrastructure, um, the knowledge divide, I think, became a shared experience for communities in wealthy countries, as well as developing and transition economy countries. And, and the last, the later, uh, as we call Eiffel, Eiffel's uh, geography. So who we are, Eiffel stands for, not for Eiffel in Paris, but it's, it's electronic information for libraries pronounced in very Lithuanian way because uh, some part of our team works from Lithuania and are Lithuanians. Uh, so it stands, as I said, electronic information for, for libraries and we are an international non-for-profit organization, not a cons consortia as as Don said, but he was also right that we work with a network of um, library consortia in um, more now 35 countries in Asia, Europe, and uh, Africa, and even more countries we reach through special projects that. Uh, involve, engage in, uh, individual library partners. So our focus is to enable access to knowledge. And that's why I'm, I emphasize that it's really not ICT crisis, it's a crisis of access to knowledge for, uh, for education, learning, research, and sustainable development. You can find more about Eiffel on our network, uh, on our web site, eiffel.net. Um, but I also give you some overview of, of what our focus areas and, and program. So uh, Eiffel works through four core programs uh, on, on special areas that to our mind 
makes um, creates barriers uh, to um, get information and uh, especially in, in developing and transitioning economic countries. So first of all, it's Eiffel licensing program, and we um, advocate and work with library consortia to have an affordable access to electronic resources. License databases um, that are critical to quality research and, and study process across the globe. Um, we also have Eiffel Open Access Program that, of course, uh, promotes the open access, open science, open data concepts. Um, importance of those uh, new scholarly communication uh, ways for research. We also admit that uh, in many developing and transition countries, um, exceptions, digital exceptions in their national copyright are very limited or non-existent. What makes libraries and education institutions unable to really support online education, digital education, um, and therefore we have a program that um, that works on to, to advocate on international and national level for fair copyright laws. And lastly, it's uh, my program, ICO Public Library Innovation Program, that uh, works with public libraries. The, the, all three earlier pro mentioned programs are actually mostly focused on, on academic and research libraries and works through, through library consortia that IFO has helped to build in, in countries, in our countries. So I hope LIC uh, is different because we are focusing on public libraries um, and, and supporting community development. Um, public Library Innovation Program has created, has been created for, for already years and, and it started with a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for a very, uh, good mission to spark public library service innovation in developing and transition economy countries. So that uh, over years, that what we did, we supported um, introduction of technology based services in over 30, uh, 350 public libraries in 27 countries in Asia, uh, Latin America, Europe and uh, Africa. Um, but re in recent years, we actually um, focused on public libraries in Africa and particularly on capacity building of public librarians to use technologies that they have um, or receive uh, from the government or other, other funders to use it for, for serving community. So, so I think over four years we have trained over 1,000 um, public librarians from 400 li over 400 libraries in uh, actually not so many countries in Ethiopia, Zambia, Kenya, Uganda, um, yeah, and, uh, and probably that it's, um, so what we all often say that uh, we have probably worked with all public libraries in these countries um, that are equipped with, with internet and computers, because that is uh, the condition of really our collaboration. Uh, you can read more about uh, what we did recently in, in just published annual report. Um, I just give a um, short uh, view on, on all our activities actually works in, on um, to implement the vision that is 
we want to see a world in which every person has knowledge they need to achieve their full uh, potential. And of course, the COVID-19 um, virus has disrupted the, this, like, um, this world. It was not perfect, but it's now even, even worse. However, I should admit that uh, most of our core activities we managed to, to continue because since 2003, actually Eiffel is working as virtual team. We have staff who works from Lithuania, Ireland, United Kingdom, Chile, Belgium, USA, France, and, uh, and Ukraine, and we are continuing su to support through digital uh, channels, our, our library consortium and library partners in, in countries. So the work continues. However, of course, we stopped our LIF trainings and because we cannot travel. Um, but um, in addition to this, um, we did some, some additional activities uh, uh, to help libraries, universities, uh, researchers, and, and also um, and students to, in this difficult time. I won't speak much about uh, this area because uh, my lab is public libraries, of course, but um, I just mentioned that um, that of course the, the COVID-19 and the closure of campuses in uh, developing and transition economy countries uh, put off uh, the edu continued education many, many students and researchers because they do not have infrastructure for remote access to even the subscribed resources. Uh, and, and in some cases, of course, they cannot afford the connectivity cost because they need to use the, the, their own uh, devices and their own uh, connectivity. Um, we, as I said, um, I'm sorry. Um, I won't speak much about university libraries, but you can follow the, the, the link and I will put it on, on the notes. Um, um, with public libraries, of course, we have reached to public libraries uh, in our, through our ancient uh, te technology mailing list that consists of uh, actually uh, 100 uh, librarians, who were our grantees, who won Eiffel Public Library Innovation Program, also young librarians who participated in our um, initiative for young public uh, in a, uh, library innovators in Africa, and so on. And we asked them what really has happened and how you are doing, as well as shared all useful resources with them, what we happened. I, I selected uh, just a few examples to, to give you a glimpse of what libraries has done and also that would help me to, to share my observation, you know, what, what might have had a difference <laughs> in response. So, of course, Lithuania is, is where I am based, uh, and uh, it's still transitioning economy countries, country, but, uh, and I know about it very well, but I think it's also stood up uh, a little with, with the response, and I will just give you an um, explanation why. So, in a, in a two weeks, actually, by, after the quarantine was called and libraries were closed, 58 central public libraries in Lithuania who had maker spaces repurposed their maker spaces uh, and 3D printers and were printing thousands of 
of uh, face shields. So they were acting at, not as just individual, um, individual library, but as a network. Though all those libraries are run by, by municipalities. Uh, of course, there were also individual sparks of, of innovative solutions, uh, like, you know, suddenly uh, consultations on ICT use for seniors were, went on, on phone in Mutana Public Library in the north of Lithuania. They also spread the, the um, information about the right uh, way of preventing the COVID and so on. They, uh, Vilnius City Library, which is capital of Lithuania, has started already early, uh, early April, has started uh, reading books for seniors over the phone service um, and had, had uh, a volunteers stepping in. Um, the, the fun thing was that even reached international media is uh, is example from Kaunas City Library, uh, which you see the the handle in the picture. Uh, so they the they use library make a space to print a, a special handle handle that you put on on the usual. <laughs> door and, and can open without really touching the, <laughs> the, the door with your, uh, uh, how you call it, um, whatever. <laughs> so they also moved uh, a, a lot of educational activities. Uh, libraries moved a lot of educational programs online, how to do things, uh, how to create example catapult as you see and so on so we we've seen a lot of individual activities but also libraries acting as as a whole um, and i should add to this that uh, public all public libraries all 1200 public libraries in lithuania regardless where they are in urban or rural Place they have access to broadband connectivity. So let's move to other examples. Examples from from Europe. We are traveling to Africa, and we have also very very interesting um, interesting cases. For example, um, in South Africa, librarians. You see the guy down at the bottom of of the presentation. Um, speaking about open access resources to the students and it's library and he's librarian who recorded a short video to provide information about where students can find resources and they did a series of those uh, video um, lessons about you know fake information about uh, how to use uh, how to learn, uh, how to rent an ebook, and so on and so on. They also did some uh, reading hours or reading, actually, minutes <laughs> or through video recordings, uh, which is really uh, great. This 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 example comes from Johannesburg Public Library, where we had a really nice young librarian who participated in our uh, um, initiative for um, Young African Innovators Program. Then we had a uh, example. Nina, can you, uh, can you conclude in a couple of minutes? Yeah, okay. Then we have examples from, from Zambia, guys who are in the middle, they actually comes from Choma, where Provincial Library of Choma has uh, uh, actually gathered creative crowd around around it and provided facilities. And of course, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, they are still 
uh, they were not able to go into library, but the library lent them um, the equipment and they recorded a very, very interesting song and fun song about COVID uh, <laughs> and so on. Also in Kenya, we had the examples, example where the uh, public library in, in Voi uh, has, be, because of very good lab, uh, they have. They uh, they beca became a county administration's COVID command and data entry service. Um, in Namibia, libraries encourage people to download and use their Namibia Reads app uh, that they had, and uh, so children that could continue reading. So, all in all, this is example comes in there probably similar to any other country. Uh, in some cases, uh, probably even more fun. But this is about libraries that have infrastructure. And, and to conclude, I, I'd like to refer to a FLIA, African uh, Library and um, Information Institution Association a survey of just recently um, presented. Uh, of 151 African libraries uh, response from 24 countries. It's like half of continent probably. Um, so uh, about uh, more, a little bit more than half of those libraries are academic uh, quarter public libraries and then other makes uh, other, other part. So about 78% were engaged in disseminating information on COVID preventive measures through their uh, mainly social media uh, and, and mobile uh, channels, mobile, uh, but also uh, about over how half of respondents, respondents were able to provide some online services. Another almost half were not able to serve their communities at all because they had to shut down their facilities, could not support remote access. Library have no social media means and also staff lack skills. And uh, in another aspect of this study is what uh, libraries think is important um, in post COVID-19 uh, era which actually um, coordinates with, with our observations and learnings when working in, in uh, less resourced uh, countries in Africa. So it's of course increased resources and online resources and services for distance education, homeschooling and remote workers, strong advocacy or just say stable and affordable internet and, and infrastructure public access infrastructure, support openness and, and sharing of knowledge for better world. And I would add collaboration between library, li different library types as well. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, focus on those who are most vulnerable and definitely have suffered uh, to most extent. That's and great. Okay. And, yeah, so that's my, my input, and I would be happy to, to answer your questions. Thanks. I hope we have some time at the end, uh, Ramona, for some uh, questions. You touched on a lot of interesting uh, and important points. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, we need to move on and uh, hear from Michael Calabrese. Uh, Michael, uh, take it away. Tell us, tell us about... Uh, uh, wireless wireless technologies <clears throat> that are available for for anyone to use, not just uh, the carriers. Michael Calabrese. Right. Yeah, thanks, Don, and hello to everyone. I'm Michael Calabrese. I direct the Wireless Future Program at uh, New America's Open Technology Institute, which is based in uh, Washington D.C. Uh, although I'm uh, physically in California uh, these days. 
and um, you know we're of course a, a, a nonprofit a policy institute, and uh, we work with uh, some of you. Let me uh, share my screen so that we can get the slides up here. Um, hopefully, you can see them. Yep. Um, yeah. So what we'll be talking about are um, <clears throat> various uh, portions of the public airwaves <clears throat> that are available um, for use by schools and libraries. In fact, are, are being used in some cases by schools and libraries to, um, to extend their, um, you know, their own networks uh, out into the community. Um, to varying degrees, as well as, of course, just to simply make um, access more robust um, inside, you know, on the, on the campus or inside the library or uh, when the doors are closed, uh, perhaps in a, in a better way in the parking lot or, or outside. So, so this is really just a, a high-level overview so that y'all can be um, aware um, that these uh, technologies, you know, are available um, and um, and are being used on a, a you know a more or less do-it-yourself basis. Uh, in many cases, Don's Gigabit Library Network, in particular, has been um, seeding a whole number of these uh, of these efforts over the past uh, several years. So, first, just so that we know what we're talking about. Um, Everyone's familiar with the public airwaves, and, and that's what the, the somewhat more technical term, electromagnetic spectrum, and it's just a range of frequencies that are useful for uh, sending and receiving information. So it's, of course, a, a commons uh, owned by the public ultimately, even when it's licensed, and um, it's uh, infinitely renewable. You can't, can't exhaust it, although uh, it can get crowded. So regulators divide the spectrum into bands of frequencies. So we'll be talking about some different bands that are available. They'll allocate them for a certain service, whether it's you know, mobile, uh, mobile uh, terrestrial, like smartphones, broadcasting, satellite and then assign licenses, sometimes by auction, uh, sometimes not, uh, or allow certain spectrum just to be shared uh, on an open, unlicensed basis, which is the most common way that li libraries, uh, of course, use that. That's what Wi-Fi operates on, is unlicensed spectrum. So these four um, uh, bands are, uh, ones we'll uh, focus on here. The, uh, the TV white space, which is very low frequency spectrum, meaning that it, it travels far and penetrates easily through walls. Citizens band radio service, which is new, and that's in the so-called mid-band spectrum, as is um, the, uh, the spectrum that's just being opened now, I mean, literally in the past uh, couple months and, and will be available soon, is also mid-band for next generation Wi-Fi at 5.9 and 6 gigahertz. And then uh, the educational broadband service spectrum, uh, which is licensed to school districts and other education uh, uh, institutions at 2.5 which is actually, um, again, extremely good propagation. So first, the TV white spaces. And what this is, is we call it white space because these are the vacant TV channels in each market. So each of the different uh, television markets around the country only use, you know, you only have so many stations that are operating over the air. They're only using so many of the channels. And particularly in, in where you don't have big cities close together, uh, there are um, quite a few vacant channels, especially in small town and rural areas. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, Don has uh, been able to count that about at least one third of US libraries are in markets 
with at least nine vacant TV channels. And so that's quite a lot of uh, spectrum because each channel is six megahertz. And, and you can aggregate uh, the channels in, in, in many cases. Um, so it's been the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, is called this super Wi-Fi. So these vacant channels are open on an unlicensed basis, uh, which is how Wi-Fi operates. But it's super in the sense that um, this, the signals uh, cover much larger areas. Uh, so you can get non-line of sight. Um, and it's a bit of a trade-off, though. It's not very high capacity, but it is a very good uh, propagation. Um, so you see here, um, on the right side there, you see the difference in the, in the area that you can cover com compared to um, regular Wi-Fi, which uses mid-band spectrum. Or on the left, you know, even after it goes a kilometer or two, it will still cut through two or three walls of a home. You know, just the way those of you who remember rabbit ears on TV sets know that you could, you know, watch the local network shows uh, in your basement just using uh, an antenna, and that's because of the characteristics of the spectrum. The um, I should just give a couple couple examples here. Don has, uh, of course, has has used TV white space, uh, uh, you know, in partnership with with libraries that use it to connect um, to provide connectivity, for example, to a to a bookmobile, to a uh, to a to a remote uh, branch to a kiosk um, to a community center. Uh, libraries can use it very easily in that way, for example, by putting an antenna on the roof of their building uh, or mounting it and then sharing, in a sense, broadcasting internet connectivity over uh, several miles in any direction. Um, schools are using it um, in Southern Virginia. Uh, the Halifax and Charlotte uh, uh, public schools, which is a you know a high poverty rural area, they had a pilot a, a few years ago, where in six they extended the network uh, in six, sixteen of their schools. They extended it to over two hundred students at home, since about half of their students actually at that time lacked internet. And currently, for example, in uh, I believe it's Hillman, Michigan. Uh, TV white space is being used to uh, provide the connectivity for school bus Wi-Fi. You know, this has become a common, uh, increasingly common thing where since school buses aren't being used to bring kids back and forth to school, schools are turning them into uh, hotspots and locating them strategically around um, their uh, community. And if schools aren't doing it, maybe libraries can borrow those buses and, and, and do the same thing. Um, using TV white space. Um, the next uh, band is the uh, Citizens Broadband Radio Service. This is a, a, a new kind of a take, a, a take on the old uh, CB radio, right? Hey, hey, good buddy. Uh, when the trucks would talk to each other, but this is uh, a, a lot more spectrum, 150 megahertz uh, for broadband, and. It's essentially, uh, it's basically U.S. spectrum that was assigned exclusively to the U.S. Navy for radar, um, except we kind of figured out that there's no ship sailing through Iowa, uh, for one thing, and also that there's technologies now that allow this, these underutilized bands to be shared. So the, the FCC adopted a three-tier sharing where um, in tier two, so the Navy is protected, they're operating just like they always do, um, there 70 of the 150 megahertz will be licensed. Auctions are next month. Um, these are countywide uh, licenses, seven licenses per county. Um, and in some rural areas, they, they could be uh, affordable. And then there's general authorized access across the entire band, meaning that effectively about 80 megahertz will be available on a, on an essentially an unlicensed basis for anyone to use, but all of it's available where a licensee has not, uh, is not operating. And the reason that can happen is because 
because of the Navy, uh, access to the band is controlled by a geolocation database, which is also true for TV white space, by the way. You're, um, when you use TV white space, you have to check in each day with a, a database. It's, it's all done automatically by the equipment, uh, but that's to make sure that some new TV station hasn't popped up that needs to be protected, uh, which of course doesn't happen, but you know, it's just, again, to justify uh, sharing the band with incumbents. And the same here, um, if you're in Iowa, you won't have to worry about that Navy ship sailing by, uh, but uh, where, where Don is in the, the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, that could easily happen. So you need to check um, uh, the database, um, but until the, uh, those who buy these licenses, until they're actually operating in your local community, as much as 150 megahertz of this, of this mid-band spectrum will be available. And it's and the gear that's being out there. This is not not yet um, unlicensed. So Wi-Fi could use the band, but nobody's making Wi-Fi gear for this band. This is going to be for um, what you might call private LTE. So LTE is what the cellular operators uh, use. For example, for your smartphone. So you could potentially, and and many companies and port authorities and uh, college campuses and others may well do this is, is you can actually operate a private LTE network uh, on this spectrum. So you could, you could be transmitting to smartphones and laptops, but it's not using Wi-Fi. It's actually using a different standard up to 150 megahertz. Then this is the one that's most important to be aware of, uh, although I think the benefits will start to come naturally to, to you. Uh, as you know, as libraries, um, you, there's no question you'll be using, taking advantage of this. The uh, the FCC just in in April voted unanimously to expand the amount of hugely expand the amount of spectrum that's available uh, for for Wi-Fi. Um, basically, as you can see here, across the entire six gigahertz band. So 1,200 additional megahertz is available. So that's compared to currently all Wi-Fi operates effectively on about 300 megahertz. Um, more is available, but it's very impeded uh, in, in, in certain ways because it shares with um, military radar in the five gigahertz band. But we're going from about 300 megahertz to 1,500 megahertz available for, um, uh, for next generation Wi-Fi. They're calling this Wi-Fi 6. And if you've heard of 5G, it's what the mobile carriers, for example, they're saying, even though there's really no 5G yet, <laughs> they're, they're claiming, you know, what they're beginning, they're beginning to deploy it. But 5G means uh, gigabit and even multi-gigabit connectivity, very low latency, the ability to coordinate hundreds of and even thousands of devices in a, in a congested place like a, a stadium uh, or a convention center or a big event. Well, Wi-Fi 6 has all these same capabilities. So it is really 5G for, for all. You don't have to wait for the billions of dollars of, uh, of infrastructure uh, to be built out by mobile carriers who obviously are charging you a subscription. Um, the, net, the new Wi-Fi routers uh, beginning to come out early next year will incorporate um, this spectrum. And there's three different, um, three different operating classes. All 1200 megahertz will be available indoors. So that's great news for libraries. Um, it means that you can do multi gigabit connectivity. So as much as, much as, as if you have a fiber connection, You'll be able to use all of it now, just, you know, share that among your patrons um, and, and broadcast it outside as well um, using standard power, which is on the right. So, so, the, so the low power indoor is, operates at about, about the power level you, that homes normally use for Wi-Fi, uh, and it can use all 1,200 megahertz with no database control. Um, if you want to use it out, outside or at full power, full wi maximum Wi-Fi power, you have to be uh, checked with be checking in 
just like those other two, just like CBRS, just like TV white space, you have to check in with the database, again, which will be an automatic thing that your, your router will do. Um, and the reason is because you can imagine this spectrum wasn't just all sitting there, it's all being used for high power uh, microwave links um, by telcos, by public safety, utilities, as well as for certain broadcasting uses. So all of this spectrum is being shared by Wi-Fi with incumbents. And at a higher power level outside of a building, um, you need to check with a database. And then finally, on the very left there, you see something the FCC is considering uh, right now. In fact, we're working on comments, trying to get them, and we believe they will authorize an even lower power option uh, which is to use uh, this for peripherals like uh, glasses. Um, so soon, <laughs> so many of us, whether in the library or walking down the street, will use these augmented reality glasses. So our smartphone will be sending extra information to us, maybe statistics uh, as we watch a baseball game or, or whatever it is. Uh, and then this, yeah. this additional piece is being is in the process also pending at the FCC to add uh, a, an additional 160 megahertz channel uh, to Wi-Fi. So most Wi-Fi use now is in five gigahertz. We'll have six, but as I just explained, it's all a little limited either by power or by database control. This, uh, if the FCC f concludes this proceeding, again, by the end of this year, you could have an, uh, the first ever 160 megahertz channel that's available without any limit. So in other words, it's full power, no database control. It's just like today's Wi-Fi, but it's gigabit, you can get up to a gigabit of speed uh, on it, a gigabit of throughput. And then finally, the uh, educational broadcast a broadband service, EBS, is at 2.5 gigahertz, which is a really, really good spectrum. It's what essentially what the cell phone carriers um, comparable to what they're using uh, today, uh, particularly Sprint. And um, uh, unfortunately, um, well, on the one hand, this spectrum is um, many, many, back in the 1960s, was licensed to uh, educational nonprofits, mainly schools. Um, and it's the only spectrum dedicated to educational use. Um, but when the internet came along, um, this sort of closed circuit TV, which is what it was being used for to sort of to broadcast um, CA TV, closed circuit TV to, you know, from a, to schools, so like the parochial schools would use it so that the bishop could uh, send, you know, could appear in every classroom. Um, the internet can do all that. So now educational um, schools are mostly leasing it out. Uh, mostly to sprint, um, uh, but others, but certain, uh, some are using it. Uh, Lindsay Unified School District, a farm worker community, very low income. They use it as part of a, an extraordinary community Wi-Fi network. You should really look this up. They have a great video on their website. Um, when COVID hit, they didn't miss a beat because every, every one of their students uh, most of them very low income were already connected to the school's uh, network through this community Wi-Fi network. And where the density is low, they use uh, EBS spectrum rather than Wi-Fi uh, to connect the students to the school network. Um, the FCC uh, decided last year that they're not going to give out any more licenses except uh, during a rural, a rural tribal priority window that closes August 3rd. That's the last chance for new free community licenses, but only in tribal areas. And then the, the commission is auctioning off um, the, the remaining, um, you know, the rest of the country, anywhere where it's not already licensed by uh, schools is being auctioned just to anyone. Um, next year, I should have shown this. These are first, this is the existing EBS licenses. They're essentially like broadcasting licenses. They're little circles based on, a, you know, a, an area from where your um, transmitter is. And they're mostly in urban, mostly in metro areas, uh, urban uh, mid-sized cities. 
um, but um, the, all, the, all the white space there is being auctioned. Um, so this isn't as relevant to libraries, but if your school district uh, has a license, um, you could use it the way Lindsay did, uh, potentially. Thanks. Stop the share here. <laughs> All right, Don, back to you, I think, or, or if there's any questions. Sorry, I'm, I'm guilty of the uh, talking on mute. <laughs> uh, excellent uh, presentation overview, Michael. It really, you know, gave us this high level view of, of this range of, of resources that are available. We're at the hour. Uh, I think we're going to go over just a couple of minutes here and try to deal with a couple of questions. One was related to uh, TV white space uh, latency and also, uh, you know, how how many people can share it? How robust is it for for accommodating multiple users? Michael, um, I'm sorry. Could you? Sure. Uh, this is a question about TV, TV white space. What is the latency of TV white space? And if a lot of students are online, how robust is it? How, how many students could be supported by uh, the, the technology? Oh, right. Okay. Well, you know, I think in terms of the latency, it, you know, it's just like your Wi-Fi today. Um, so I don't think you would really notice that. So in other words, it's not, Latency means delay, right? So it, it would not be good for uh, real-time gaming um, and, uh, and, and even for uh, Wi-Fi calling, you know, it, it, it may be noticeable, um, but certainly you can stream, stream video, do everything you do, you know, on your home Wi-Fi. Uh, it just goes farther. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, capacity, you know, that, and 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 the numbers you could you could reach if you're if you're broadcasting the the connectivity over over an area um, it, it you know the numbers that could use the number of students for example that could use it or or pay library patrons that could use it simultaneously will depend um, really probably on how many uh, channels um, you can bond together. So, for example, I, you know, I think it would be fairly typical um, in a particular direction, for example, to have, you know, two or three channels, 12 or 18 uh, um, megahertz, um, which is, you know, is, is uh, comparable to probably a, 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 a good, um, to, a, to a very good, uh, like a high capacity DSL connection. So, Again, depending on what, um, you know, 20 or 30 could use it, but they couldn't all be streaming, you know, high def video at the same time. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a good point about, uh, you know, capacity and, and connectivity. And uh, so a lot of these things we'll, we'll get deeper into as we go through a series and and talk about each of these separately and some use cases. Uh, Michael's touched on a number of them. Um, uh, we're, we're hearing, uh, well, a quest, one question is your slides, which you just sent to me, and we'll, we'll try to make available somewhere uh, for, you know, in addition to the recording here. Uh, Shelby Coalition is on Unidentified Individual uh, talking about EBS, which is a hot item right now. Who's on for Shelby and would like to uh, say what Shelby is doing about uh, the EBS licenses? Anyone there? Can you unmute? I see John Windhausen. We can't hear you, John. Can you hear me now? Not very well. Well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'll put something in the chat, but we are working to try to give libraries and schools a chance to get EBS licenses next year. And I'll be happy to talk to anybody who would like to join us in that effort. And, uh, okay, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the, I think the point is that the, uh, that the auction 
was uh, supposed to happen this year, but will not happen this year just because of the, the crowded agenda. And it's now scheduled for next year. But uh, John, I think, is making the point that there are opportunities for changes in how this is handled and perhaps making the, the case more uh, assertively that uh, it's really an, an important resource and there's not a higher priority than supporting uh, the intentional, the intended use of the spectrum, which is educational applications. So yeah, John, please post anything there. Uh, Shelby is leading on this uh, and, and doing great work there. Uh, yeah. Kinber, I did, go ahead. I didn't Michael. want to, you know, just add that I didn't want to get into, you know, political scenarios, but since there, since the auction is um, delayed and there is an election, in November, we could have an entirely new FCC uh, by early next year, and they could easily revisit um, revisit this. So it would be important for the commission to hear from libraries and schools that would make use of this. Good point. I, uh, I know you regret being drawn into a political position here, but... Uh... It's, it actually is a point to remember. Uh, things do change as we as we have seen. Uh, Kinber is on. Kinber is the uh, Pennsylvania Research and Education Network. Hello, Jennifer. Supporting the uh, EBS set aside, joining the effort. Yep. And uh, uh, just trying to catch up on the chat here. Uh, Michael indicated a 750 meeting meter radius for TV white space. Uh, no, no, I don't think Tom, that was what, uh, what he said. It's, uh, you know, 10, 15 kilometers, uh, white space, right. white Wi-Fi measured in, you know, tens of meters, TV white space and hundreds or even thousands of meters. Uh, and while it is called, you know, non light of sight, uh, it, it does have limitations. It goes through treetops, but it won't go through a forest is what we've discovered. It will go over a hill, but it won't go through a mountain. So, uh, but it, it does fill a, a specific uh, role in difficult areas. Um, so, okay, Tom Rolfus from Nebraska is suggesting to look at the slide review the slide. Okay, I, I think this is a good point to uh, uh, halt the recording. We, we are over our 60 minutes a little bit, but we do stick around and we're happy to uh, keep this conversation going. But Stephen, if you could stop the recording now, I want to thank everybody. And, and first, Stephen, before you stop the recording, uh, I'd like everybody to unmute, yeah, if you yeah. can, unmute and uh, give our presenters a hand, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>